Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Now that everybody's sufficiently sleepy, um, let me pray. Uh, Father, thank you again for this, for bringing us to this place. Thanks for uh, your word and the truth of it. Thanks for the ability to gather and consider what it means practically uh, as we consider truth and all sorts of applications uh, in our lives as we seek to carry forward all that you've given us uh, in your glory to do. I just pray that you bless our time this morning and encourage us in Christ we pray. Uh, so I was, I am a road biker and I was riding this morning and uh, I was riding a 98 because it's a long straight shot and there's a wide shoulder. Um, but I hugged the, the, the far side of the road, so the right side of the road, because you can go 55 miles an hour on 98, so it can get a little dangerous. So it was warm, uh, and I took my water bottle with dumping it on my head and kind of drifted off into the grass. So I had clipless pedals, so I had to, had to stop and make sure I got myself. And I saw this rustling in the grass. Um, and you know, there's stuff laying all over the side of the road, and it's black, and it doesn't really look scary. It could be a belt off of a car or something like that. Well, all of a sudden, the snake head pops up out of the grass and hisses at me. Um, and I got in my clipless pedals as fast as I possibly could. And it's not like it was a big hill because there aren't big hills in Florida. But I went normally up this incline. I probably would go about 17 miles an hour, but I actually went about 22 miles an hour uh, up this part of the hill. So I tell you this story because there was an adrenaline rush that comes when there's something exciting or scary or interesting. I can't create that for you to make sure that you have the energy this morning to do what we're doing. But we're going to we're gonna kind of wrap up because we're not going to meet again. You're at the end of these sessions. But what we're going to do is take what we learned from creation. What does it mean that we're creating God's image and we've been given this rule and this capacity to be in relationship? What does it mean, though, that we're also, we're also fallen in sin? We're, 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 we're like Adam and Eve. We, we do the same things that they do. Their nature is our nature. Yesterday we spent the whole day talking about redemption. What does it mean that God's redeemed us through the blood of His Son, that He's invited us to be members of His family, that He's given us this great inheritance that's not perishable, and He's given us the power to kind of live in a world that's not yet. We're not yet, we've not yet received that inheritance. We have something to look forward to, but how does that help me get through this? So today we're going to talk about consummation. Uh, so creation, fall, redemption, consummation, and all of these things is part of our identity because all of these things are in who we are. So consummation is that day that right God's coming back to completely restore to its full glory all that He's created. So we're going to talk about what, what does that have to do with you and your overarching identity. But I want to go back to your post-its because we're going to tie this in at the end. I am valued by the people that love me most when I don't do anything that conflicts with what they think specifically. Think about that for a minute. I'm valued by the people that love me most when I don't do anything that can conflicts with what they think specifically. So if I think something different than you and you do it, then I love you. But if I think something different than you and you don't do it, then I don't. I am loved by people most... When I'm valued by people who love me most when I impress them. I am valued by people most when I test well. Um, I am valued by people most when I act like a leader. And one of the things we're going to talk about this morning is, is everybody supposed to be a leader? And, and here's what I as an adult often do. Do you know what it means to be an extrovert, by the way? So if I say I'm an extrovert, what does that really mean? People get to jazz. People give me jazz. That's good. Uh, Was that exactly what you were going to say, too? Sorry. You can be charged by being with people and like, uh, being active. Yes, both of you are exactly right. 100% correct, actually. When you're an extrovert, that means you get all of your energy. You get jazzed by being with people. So if I have to go sit in my office and do paperwork, even when it's not, even, even though it could be fun paperwork, Right? I couldn't do that for a long period of time or I'll fall asleep at my desk. But I could go meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting 
being with people, and at the end of the day, I'd be so wired I couldn't go to sleep. Are you all like that? How many of you are like that? How many of you are like being with people all day long? It's not that it's not fun and you don't like it. It's not that you don't like people. But at the end of the day, when you're with people all day long, you're exhausted. Like every ounce of energy is strapped out of you. Here's what has a tendency to happen with young people. We crown, remember that original statement that I made, it's, it's always too early to canonize a teenage saint? We have a tendency to canonize teenage saints who are primarily extroverts or introverts. Which one? Extroverts. extroverts. Because they're the ones that take on their gregarious leadership roles. They're the ones that are willing to stand up in front of a crowd of people and do crazy things. But an introvert, the idea of standing up in front of a lot of people and doing something crazy so all attention is drawn to you, even if it's something fun, is that something that makes you really excited or is that something that horrifies you? The reality, though, we live in a broken world where adults, like me, have a tendency to ascribe value based on the fact that you're an introvert or you're an extrovert. But those things have really no bearing on your capacity to be a positive contributor to the kingdom of God. And that's some of what we're going to talk about. So I am, this, this is an interesting thing for me as an adult who leads young people, what it means that you feel valued if you're a leader, and if for some reason you don't do those things that we value as leaders, then you're not valued as much. And then if I overcome something I've been struggling with, which is a good idea, I'm valued by people that love me most when they see me overcome something that I struggle with. I, I disappoint people that love me most when I am when I fail to control my anger. I am most disappointing to the people who love me most when I'm careless. Here's an interesting one, and I'll close with this part of this with this one. I, I disappoint people who love me most when I act like a Democrat. Um, again, interesting comment. <laughs> Uh, but I would say probably true. I, I don't know that all of you would feel that way, uh, but particularly, how many of you are from the South? You've always lived in the South. Okay, I lived most of my life in, in Chicago, where it wasn't synonymous. It means, you know what that means? It wasn't, you were a Christian and you were a Republican. You could be a Christian and be a Democrat, but in the South, is that easy to be? No. But here's part of the struggle, is what we're recognizing is there are things about our political affiliations that doesn't mean we don't want certain things and we want other things all the time as a political party platform does. But there's an interesting thing that's happening with you. This is really, really good. You really care about social justice. You, you really care when you see that there are things that are happening that are unjust. Those are valuable things because Scripture spends an enormous amount of time talking about it. Caring for those that are less fortunate. But believe it or not, we're going to tie all this stuff in at the end. Uh, this is not a book plug. This is actually, if you follow Twitter, although he writes books too, if you're a Twitter person, I'd really recommend you follow this guy. He's a guy. His name is Leslie Nubian. Uh, he really gets the application of the gospel and the kingdom of God in today's world. So I want to read a couple things to you, because not because you can't read, because I want to highlight a couple of things. We are not honest and open-minded explorers of reality. We are alienated from reality because we made ourselves the center of the universe. What does that really mean in reference to things we've talked about already in the last two days? If I'm at the center of my own universe, what does that mean about my ability to see what's actually happening around me? It's not really a whole lot happening around you. You can really examine yourself. Your right. That you are the universe. So my perspective when I'm at the center of my own universe is accurate. Distorted. It's distorted. Mine as much as yours. This isn't an adult, young person thing. This is a humanity thing. When we put ourselves at the center of our own universe, when we think that we know what our circumstances are in totality, when we think we understand those things, we're actually far from reality and we're actually an alien. The next statement says, We are by nature idolaters constructing images of truth shaped by our own desires. 
We are by nature idolaters. I've said again and again and again, we have these hearts that are idol factories. But, but our idolatry may look different. Idolatry isn't creating, well it is, it's certainly not less than this, but it's way more than this. It's not, I'm an idolater if I create a graven image of myself and I, I look at it all day long. But I could write something that I think is really good, and I could have it published, and that really good thing that I wrote could become an idol. If you really think I did a good job in here and I get really excited about that, could the good that has been done in this environment, the good things that I have said, could they become an idol? Yes. If you really, really, really work hard in school and you're really, really, really successful, could those good things become an idol? Yes. Yes. So what this is really saying is, it's not just about the fact that we are idolaters, it's that our idolatry actually shapes what we believe is true. These two statements are connected. That what we think, what we put at the center of a universe is what we believe is true. So as we look at these things, I'm valued most by people that love me when I perform. Is it likely that adults can put that on you? Is that likely? Is it also likely that that can be inside of you? That adults may hold appropriate standards and say, you know what, God's given you gifts, you're called to use them. The parable of the talents is true. We can't just bury our gifts in the ground. If the Bible does say, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, that doesn't mean you're the master of it, but that means that you have to work at it. Obedience is a gift. It's a, it's a lifeline of grace. But does this mean that it's possible that when adults in my life set standards for me that are appropriate standards, that I, I, I wither under those standards, and I say, you don't love me unless, you do these, unless I do these things, when in reality, they do love you even when they do those things, but those standards are appropriate for them to set. Is that possible? Right? Is your sin as likely to corrupt you as my sin is to corrupt me? So how do we deal with that? How do we figure that out? I'm telling you that I'm broken. So if you're my child, or you're a student of mine, or you play for me because I also coach, there are going to be times that I set appropriate standards for you and give you opportunity to meet, and I ask you to work hard to get it, and you're going to believe that I won't care about you unless you hit those standards. And it's going to be my fault. Because sometimes I do that. Sometimes I, I only love my wife when she loves me first. When she does what I need her to do, then I'm willing to express and demonstrate my love for her. But sometimes, sometimes when I set those standards for you, those standards might be appropriate. And it's your idolatry it's your putting yourself at the center of your own universe that's causing you to see this corruptedly. So how do you how do you deal with that? How do you figure out which one's true? I, I think what you wrote on these post-it notes in a lot of ways is really insightful. And as adults, we really need to work hard at this. And we need to understand a better way in a performance-oriented world that is way more performance-driven than most cultures before us. I think we need to figure out a way to understand that. But you also have to figure out a way to understand the adults in your life that really care about you and have a lot more tread that has come off their tires because they've driven a lot more miles in life than you have. But if we're both sinners... How do we not just throw up our hands and say, this just is awful? There's no solution to this. What do we do? Because, right, if we don't walk out of here saying, I have an identity that's rooted in the fact that I've been given this inheritance that comes only in the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. And it's a beautiful thing. Oh, great. But that doesn't change the fact that when I go home... I'm going to feel like I'm going to wither under the weight of my parents' expectations. 
Or worse yet, I was just trying to be funny last night, and my youth leader got all over me and made me feel like I was a complete idiot because I just wanted to have fun. And nobody understands me. If they took the time to understand who I really was and why I did this, then everything would be fine, but nobody understands me. How do we get through that? Well, since you're still talking, okay. Let, let's, let's skip this one, and let's go to this one. The end is not private joy, but social joy. And, and I don't mean like, let's just have a good time all the time, like social events, joy. Well, it's not, that's not what Leslie Newbigin, Newbigin believes. These are all his quotes. It is the joy of God and His people together. The end of God's desire for your joy is the joy for you to be in fellowship, in relationship with Him. That's part of what Jesus has allowed, right? Jesus ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, not just as a king. He sits at the right hand of God also as a priest. What does Jesus, sitting in the right, right next to God, have to do with you if Jesus is a priest? What do priests typically do? What's their functional role? They intercede between God and his people. They intercede. Great answer. So the three answers I've gotten from the audience today have been absolutely spot on. So a priest, that means Jesus, if, if what he's saying, if he really is spot on, if what he's saying is actually true, what does that mean that Jesus is doing for you? On an every moment basis. What does that mean? He's like a he's the mediator, he's the bridge, bridge the gap between us and God. Yeah. He's saying, I, he's your child. He's saying when you screw up, when you don't get it right, and you're throwing up your hands going, Lord, I have no idea. This doesn't make any sense. I don't even know. I'm struggling to believe that this whole redemption thing is really true and there's any joy in this because all I experience on a daily basis is mess. I'm not finding any joy in this at all. Jesus is actually interceding for you with the Creator of the universe to say He's your beloved son or He's your beloved daughter. But the end of all that is a relationship, not just with God, a vertical relationship. But remember, what did God give you in giving you His image? Rule and dominion over all of creation, and what else? Another R. Relationship. He gave you the capacity to be in relationship with others. That's why. That's why RYM is a great idea, a great concept. But how do you transfer all of the community that you're forced to have because you're sitting together, you're being together, how do you transfer that community to the rest of your life and experience? This is what we have to answer. This is what consummation is. So redemption is real, but what's actually going on in the world today that helps me deal with the fact that I don't feel valued by the people that love me most unless I perform, and I feel like a lot of things are causing the people that love me most to be disappointed. Because one of the things you would learn if you sat and paid attention to all the post-it notes is there's a big bucket of things that you all believe have an impact on the love that those that love you most have for you. There's a humongous bucket. Right? And we just acknowledged, right, that some of that feeling of disappointment is because we do it to you, and some of that feeling of disappointment is because you put yourself at the center of your own universe. And what we have to figure out is if God's primary goal, His primary joy, His primary glory is found in your relationship with Him and your relationship with His creation, then what do we do about that? So let's turn to Scripture and see what Scripture says. So let's lay a groundwork, groundwork for this to start with. We're going to look at Romans first. Let's look at Romans 8. Verse 18. Okay, somebody just read verse 18. Somebody new that hasn't read a verse before. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing the glory that is to be revealed to us. Okay, 
So the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that has been that's going to be revealed to us. And part of that has been revealed in the fact that you've been given this great inheritance. Remember? That's what we talked about yesterday. Redemption's given you this great inheritance. Here's look at the purple. We have to think globally, act locally, and keep our eyes on him who dies that all might live. We've got to have a bigger picture. We have to get ourselves out of the center of our universe. So we have to think bigger. So one of the encouragements I want to give you that I have to give myself on a daily basis is you have to find ways to be in God's Word to experience His promise and blessing. If you read the Old Testament, what you're going to find is again and again and again the people of God in the Old Testament who had this representation of God, the presence of God was with them in a pillar of cloud by night and a pillar of fire by day, constantly turned away from believing that God's promises were true. So what what did God call them to, to help them as a lifeline of grace, as a means of His grace? He gave us His Word so that we could be reminded we're a faithless, forgetful people that God's promises really are true. So I'm not help telling you, have a quiet time because it'll make you a better person. I'm telling you, in your quiet time, no matter how hard sometimes it's going to read, what God promises is you will find this joy in relationship with Him and you will find a constant reminder that His promises are true. Where else can you look in this world, I asked this question before, and find redemption from your failure that says the greatest thing in the world emptied himself completely so that you could live? You see what this says? We have to think globally, act locally, and keep our eyes on him who dies that all might live. So the first verse, that's what it's saying. Now, it's interesting to me in this passage, if we park there, look at verse 19. What does verse 19 say? Somebody read that, just 19. For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. What does that say? So just, just all of us who are created in God's image, who our souls have been redeemed in Christ, it's the only thing that's wait, we're the only ones that's waiting in eager anticipation for Christ's return, right? No, all of creation is waiting for the return of the king, for consummation, for all of this to be made right. And then it says, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory of the children of God. So that means creation is subject to corruption. Right? Give me some examples of creation. Tree. Good. That's a great answer. (laughs) I'm not so sure about snakes. But yes, that's true. That's true. What else? What? Us. Us. Good answer. Ocean. What? Ocean. The ocean. Yes, that's creation. What else? Sky. Space. Sky. Is it all physical things? Is it all things like like this building? Art. Is, literature, music. Art, literature, music. I'm a huge Dave Matthews Band fan. Okay? I I do believe that my love of improvisational music. That means I love going to concerts and listening to a song that's played one way the day before, played a completely different way the next day, and I see the glory of God and the way all those instruments can make that music come together. Have you ever heard of Fish? P-H-I-S-H, the band? It's crazy how good they are. Okay, I love that and see God's glory. Now, these are not guys that profess the name of Jesus Christ. Can those who don't believe in Jesus reflect the glory of God? Yes. Why is that? How do we know that's true? Because they're remaining God's in the dark. Yes. Is government part of God's creation? Yes. Is government corrupt? Yes. Has there ever been a government or a nation in the history of humanity post-fall that hasn't been corrupt? So when government does corrupt things, should we be surprised? 
So where is our hope? Christ. Well, let's look at the passage. But the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory of the children of God. Does that mean when our government makes a bad decision that we don't like, that inhibits the spread of the gospel, that in some way that this promise, what's the promise in this verse? The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Is there anything on this earth that can stop God's implementing His kingdom on earth? Is there anything that can stop that? Is that the way we act? No. We think the Supreme Court can stop. We do. Now, I'm not saying the Supreme Court was right. Don't hear me say that when the Supreme Court makes a decision in Roe v. Wade that I think it's right to abort babies. That's not what I'm saying. I think it's wrong. Should we work to see that change? Should we work to see the lives of unborn children protected? Absolutely. Does it seem hopeless sometimes? Yes, because the world is broken. But what do we know from this promise? Going to make it right. God's going to make it right. That's what we know from this promise. So creation is broken too, but creation is also going to be remade. It's going to be made new. Because that's what this passage says. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not, we will wait for it with patience. So what we have in this passage, now remember, this is Romans 8. This is... This is the passage that's saying all things work together for good for those who are loved by God and called according to His purpose. It's the promise chapter of Romans. And it's interesting because Paul in Romans chapter 9, which is the passage we most often want to skip, because that's the passage that says, Jesus have I loved, or, 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 or Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. And it's a really hard passage to preach. But, but do you know why Romans 9 was written after Romans 8? Anybody know why? Because Paul anticipates this, this book of Romans was written for all of us, but it was written to people in Rome who were being persecuted. And you know what they were saying? Look, if God's promises are true, why is all this bad stuff happening? And he says, because God's going to make all things right. While all of creation is groaning, while everything may appear to be a mess, the promises of God are true. And it's already happening. The kingdom of God is going to be fully consummated on a day in the future that I wish would happen quicker than it probably will. But the kingdom of God has already been inaugurated. That's why the ascension of Jesus is so important. The ascension of Jesus to His rightful place as King at the right hand of God says the kingdom of God is already here. Jesus is already seated in His kingdom. The kingdom of God is spreading on earth. This is number two recommendation. We have to look for it. And you know what? When God touches someone's heart at a place like RYM and says, my hope is found in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, we don't just celebrate for that one person because it's not private joy, it's social joy, it's the joy of God and His people together. We celebrate because when those things happen, the kingdom of God is advancing. And you don't do the advancing. The Holy Spirit is the one that makes it work. But God's invited you as His image bearers redeemed in Him to participate in the glory of the spreading of His kingdom. Do you get that? That you've been given a role, no matter what your gifts are, extrovert, introvert, you've been given a role to be part of this beautiful plan to make all things new. And when you fail... God doesn't give up on you. 
Because of what Jesus has done, when you screw up and you make two steps forward and 14 steps back, and then you get back on your bike and you make two more steps forward, and then you make six steps back, the blood of Jesus Christ, the fact that my only hope in life and in death is not my own, is not that I belong to myself, but to my faithful Savior Jesus Christ, means, this is what it really means, that God's not looking down on you from heaven and saying, I gave my blessing to the wrong person. I invited the wrong person to be adopted as my child. He's not doing that. I might. Well, let me rephrase that. I will. Because the reality is when we think about it, the only thing that we can promise one to another in this room is that we will fail each other. But God's promise is He will never fail you. So as you sit and you look at all these post-it notes of all the way we feel like we have to do this to be valued, or this or people are going to be disappointed, that's not the way God's economy as a father works with you. That's not the way it works. But it gets even more exciting. So let's turn to a book that we most often skip over. That's Revelation. So we're going to look at Revelation, I think, 21. Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Somebody read verses 1 and 2. Somebody different. Somebody that hasn't read before. There you go. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And then I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Okay, so what what are we seeing in this image? So so John's seeing a picture of, of the current and future glorification of all things. And what this is a primary picture of is what's happening at the full consummation. What's happening to heaven? What's happening to New Jerusalem? Where is it moving? I I can't hear it. Down to earth. Something's happening here where the new heaven is moving to earth. Now let me give you my little bit of history. I grew up in a church that essentially said... At the end times, this whole creation is such a mess, it's going to burn, and we're going to go to heaven someplace, and we're going to float around with spiritual bodies. Now, what would be the practical application of that end times view? If all the earth is going to burn anyway, if it doesn't really matter, and we're all going to, and when Jesus returns and everything's fully consummated, we're going to all go back and we're going to float around with heavenly bodies then practically, what do I think about anything that's on this earth? So I can eat and drink whatever I want, right? Because my physical body's going to go away. Do I need to care about caring for this creation? If it's all going to burn anyway, why would I bother? Because that's not what this is about. But in this, what we see is... God's telling John in this beautiful picture, in this imagery, the new heavens and the earth are coming together. That means, right, let's connect it to Romans chapter 8. All creation groans for the return of the king. Does that passage seem to indicate that the the king's going to return and restore all of creation? Yes? It's possible, right? It's possible I love Thai food. It's possible my love of Thai food may be represented in the new heavens and the new earth. I don't really know, but it's possible. Because God loves creation. He loves creativity. It's possible. But what does this have to do with post-it notes about disappointment and, 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 and what, what value I have? As image bearers of God, redeemed in Him, given this inheritance, you've been given gifts to participate in the reconciliation of all things, as Colossians 4 says. So Romans 8 says all things is all of creation. Revelation 21 says new heavens and new earth are going to be brought together and something significant is going to happen. That I happen to believe is going to be better than the Garden of Eden. You know why? Why would I say the new heavens and the new earth are going to be better than the Garden of Eden before sin? 
What one thing, if sin would never have happened, would we not have realized if you were in the Garden of Eden? The love of God in every... The love of God in the act of sending His only Son to carry the weight of sin to death and resurrection so you never had to experience it. So when God makes all things new, you're going to enter into that newness knowing that God rescued you with His Son. Let me say that again. He rescued you with His Son and He gave you the privilege of participating in giving foretaste of God's kingdom to come. Now let me explain that. First we're going to say we have to think globally and act locally. So I'm going to give you an illustration. What time is this over? 10.30? Right, so I, I have a love for... Uh, you know those frozen yogurt places? They have this thing called Sweet Frog in Chattanooga. I don't know if they have it here. You know those places where you get to go and you get to fr- put the frozen yogurt in the bucket and they weigh it by the pound? And, and I fill up my bucket thinking, what, can this can't be expensive? Last time we went there with four people and my bill was $42. $42. $10 each for ice cream. But you know what? You know how you get to put all those flavors in and mix them together, and then you get to go in there and get to dump all the stuff on it? Does anybody else like this besides me? I do. (laughs) Oh, I love those places. Okay, so when a new flavor comes up, like there was this one last night called Mojito, and I'm thinking, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. I'll have to try that. Do I have to buy it to try it? No. What wonderful invention do they have behind the counter if you ask for it? Sample cups. cups. So they have sample cups that I can participate in in seeing the glory of frozen yogurt and some great flavor. That's what God's called you to do as bearers of His image that are redeemed in Him. This is the beautiful thing. Is that he doesn't value you less when you fail to do this well. Because you have a Savior that's interceding for you. And you get to give people foretaste of what the glory of God's kingdom is going to look like. So when we plant a church in the middle of an inner city... And not just we hold worship there, but we help clean up the neighborhood around us. Not, I'm not talking about cleaning up bad people. I'm talking about physically caring for God's creation around the church. When the area around the church looks different, when we plant flowers, do you see how that connects? If it's done in the context of the gospel, not by itself, how it connects with Romans chapter 8. <coughs> Because you're giving a picture of what the kingdom looks like. Now this is the hard part. If the church decided that building wasn't good and it moved, and nobody cared for that same space, would it go back to the way it was? Okay, that's the messy part. That's why I say it's a foretaste. Because you're not giving the completed picture of His kingdom. When we submit ourselves and empty ourselves of things that are important for us, for the benefit and joy of another, do you see how you are able then to give a foretaste of God's kingdom to come? Don't we all want to be part of something significant? Don't we all want to be part of something that's making a difference? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, you already are. Let me say that again. You already are. Because of what Jesus has done, you get to participate in letting people know the glory of His kingdom. But folks, when we freak out because our Supreme Court makes a really bad decision, wherever you fall on that, I'm just going to sit here and say it was a bad decision. But does God's care for representing His kingdom through the beauty of the marriage that He created, has it, in some way... Has this diminished God's capacity to represent Himself and the glory that He meant for us? Has it? No. Because Scripture tells us this is true. Not because Chad tells you this is true, 
Now again, just like Roe v. Wade, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't work to protect the lives of the unborn, but do we do it with hope or without hope? And if I read the majority of Facebook and Twitter feeds on this issue from two weeks ago with the Supreme Court on same-sex marriage, would the general representation of that be people with hope of God's sovereign plan to let His kingdom come, or would it be without hope? Okay, then you have an opportunity to do something about that. You have the opportunity, even at this age, to say to those of us who are older, look, we're not saying this is good, but the Supreme Court's not bigger than God's plan to bring His kingdom to pass. This isn't going to undermine God's capacity to bring His kingdom. Should we speak truth in love? Should we have great hope? Yes, absolutely. So here's what I'm going to say in closing. I, I think it's really, really, really valuable for you all to keep talking about these two questions that we started. That I feel valued from the people who love me most when, and I feel I'm disappointing people who love me most when, it's really important to talk about these things. But talk about it from the perspective that way too often we put ourselves at the center of our own universe. So sometimes when adults, you feel like adults are putting undue pressure on you, and if you disappoint them, they're not going to love you. Sometimes that's true, and sometimes it's not. And if we're willing to defer to one another in love and have these conversations with each other, holding each other accountable, not just doing emotion dumps. You know what those are? It's not okay just to dump what you feel on anyone you feel like dumping it on. It is okay to say, this is what I feel, but because I'm likely to have myself at the center of my universe, could you help me with this? So because God's given you the capacity to have dominion over creation and bring about His, not bring His kingdom, but participate in God and the Holy Spirit bringing His kingdom, because He's given you that opportunity and because His desire in creating you in His image is to give you capacity to, to give foretaste of His kingdom in relationships, then have those conversations. And you know what? Are you going to have to have those conversations once? All the time. All the time. That, that's part of the curse. Because it means you're going to express yourself and there's going to be times when adults are going to fail you and they're going to say, I'm really sorry, you're right, I failed you. And they're going to be sincere and they're going to be authentic. And then two weeks later, what are they going to do? The same thing all over again. And there are going to be times where you fail adults and you're sincere and you're repentant and you're authentic. And two weeks later, you're going to do the same thing again. And the only way we're going to know that the redemption of Jesus Christ is actually blessing your relationships is when we actually talk about them. And then here's the last thing. And, and this to me is the most important thing in this day and age. We've covered 11 scripture passages in three days. We have to be in serious, and I'm not talking about serious in a way that isn't fun. We have to be in serious study of what God's Word is actually te teaching us. We have to know what the biblical narrative is actually saying. Number one, because we need to know what the truth is, and it's too easy to pull things out of context. Right? And then we get swayed by the evil of the age. But we also need to see the hope that happens... In this mess of redemption and waiting for future glory, there's this cycle of trial and error and failure and success that is gut-wrenchingly difficult for all of us. But what reading God's Word does is it helps us to be reminded that Abraham, that screwed up guy that sold his wife, tried to sell his wife into prostitution with Pharaoh twice, that screwed up guy... Judah, of whom Jesus came from his line, slept with his son's daughter, who he thought was a prostitute. 
And Jesus came from that brokenness. We have to read and understand those stories because the ebb and flows of your life and the disappointment that you face, I don't mean to be offensive. There's nothing new under the sun. And with God, the beauty of God's plan to, to, to reconcile us to Him is He's given us a word that isn't just a list of rules and propositions. It is some of those things. But it's a lot of narrative about people's lives who have gone through, in a different age, things that were really difficult and left them feeling they weren't valued or they were a huge disappointment. But in the promises of God, we see that's not true. So I'll leave you with this. The love of God in Christ means that your guilt and shame is re removed. Go live in that joy. Thanks. You've been great. Have a good rest Thank of the day. You. Thank you.